Bienvenue to our fifth lecture of our Château de la Loire and Ile-de-France series. My name is Stanislas. I'm the director of the Alliance Française Miami Metro, and I'm delighted to welcome to our two special guests, Henri Meunier, who will open the door of the Château de Chenonceau, and the series curators, Russell Kelly. For those who are not very familiar with Zoom yet, there is a few tips. For the images, you can choose show video if you want us to see you or hide video if you choose not to. For the sound, you have all have been muted for noise control purposes and will remain so during a presentation. However, you can use the chat at the bottom of your screen and at any time to ask questions or just communicate. In fact, you can just write right now and tell us from where you are listening. You don't see any of these icons, move your cursor to the back black part at the bottom of your screen and they will appear. Remember, chat your question and they will be answered in a Q&A session at the end. This series would not have been possible without our lead partner, Alliance Française de Chicago. Bonjour, IMA and her team. And we welcome our friend for all the Alliance Française of the US network, the French Heritage Society and participant from WISE in Paris. Bonsoir, Paris. Russell Kelly, Vice President of the Alliance Française Miami Metro, bordering Miami, has created this series. Is the author of The Making of Paris, the story of how Paris evolved from a fishing village into the world's most beautiful city, which we had the privilege to hear as conference and his book soon to be published. He has lived in France for nearly 30 years and visited every chateau featured in a series many times. Thank you. Take it over, Russell. Thank you, Stanislas. Uh, and while I've lived in France for 30 years, I'm speaking to you now from near Miami, where it is uh, 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Henri Meunier, who's coming to us from the Chateau de Chenonceau, where it is 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The Chateau de Chenonceau has been in the Meunier family continuously since 1913, the year before the beginning of the Great War, in which, as uh, Henri will tell us, the Chateau de Chenonceau played an important role. The first three lectures of the series uh, have featured royal chateaux in the Loire Valley that were directly or indirectly connected with the great Renaissance King Francois Premier. He was raised at the Chateau d'Amboise. When he became king, he lived at the Chateau de Blois with his wife Claude until her death in 1524. And he built from scratch the monumental Chateau de Chambord. His, his uh, connection with Chenonceau was less direct. Uh, he confiscated the recently rebuilt Chateau de Chenonceau from the son of his former treasury superintendent, superintendent Thomas Boyer in 1535, but as Henri Meunier will explain, it was first the mistress and then the widow of Francois Premier's son, Henri II, who had the greatest impact on the chateau. And they are but two of the many women involved in the construction and preservation of the magnificent Chateau de Chenonceau, which is why uh, it is known for good reason as the Chateau des Dames, the Chateau of the Ladies. But before Henri uh, starts his presentation, he invites us to watch a two minute film that shows the spectacular setting of the chateau and gardens of Chenonceau.
Over to you, Henri. Thank you very much, Russell. And thank you, everyone, uh, uh, for participating today in uh, a presentation about the Chateau de Chenonceau, uh, who has been uh, in my family uh, for about 100 years. And so we'll start now with the presentation of a unique and singular castle in the Loire Valley. So this presentation will touch uh, to different subjects. Uh, we will talk a bit about the history of its owners, uh, uh, then look at uh, the architecture, the overall uh, current state uh, of the castle and how it evolved today. We will then dive into the collections, uh, uh, look in detail to, at some paintings, uh, then up towards the garden. The last points uh, will finish uh, with the, uh, the um, current events uh, in Chenonceau and the next projects uh, uh, that are uh, upcoming. Uh. So first of all, let's see where Chenonceau is. So Chenonceau is located in the Loire Valley, not very far from uh, Chambord and Blois. It's about uh, less than an hour drive and about two hours and a half drive from Paris. There's a direct TGV line that goes to Tours. So you can door to door go from Paris to uh, the gates of Chenonceau in about an hour and a half. Chenonceau's history is quite fascinating. It is uh, singular uh, since uh, the major actors of this history have uh, been nearly all women. Uh, it started uh, mainly with uh, Diane de Poitiers, the favorite of Henry II. Uh, Diane de Poitiers, as his mistress, uh, managed to uh, uh, buy Chenonceau from the previous owners uh, who had mishandled uh, government funds. And so as uh, she bought uh, the domain, uh, she was extremely interested in developing uh, this domain, especially uh, from a garden point of view. So her main focus was the garden. Of course, being the favorite of King Henry II, there was a rivalry with Catherine de Medicis, his wife, uh, legitimate wife. And so when Henry II uh, passed away, Catherine uh, basically kicked uh, Diane de Poitiers out of Chenonceau uh, by offering her a bargain that she couldn't refuse, uh, uh, taking over the Chateau de Chaumont and Catherine de Medicis uh, then took over Chenonceau. Catherine de Medicis had great plans for Chenonceau, uh, especially for her sons, uh, and wanted to turn Chenonceau into a castle that was focused on pleasures, uh, entertainment, uh, but also as a center of power uh, in order to uh, have many festivities uh, and be able to control uh, the numerous uh, influent people that were gravitating around the court and in France. Unfortunately, uh, the son of Catherine, the last son of Catherine de Medicis, Henry III, passed away after being assassinated by a fanatical monk. And so the estate never really managed to uh, turn into what Catherine had hoped it for be, to it for be. Since the dynasty of the Valois ended, uh, the next king was Henry IV uh, of the Bourbon dynasty, and he preferred uh, to stay in Paris, uh, in the Louvre. And then, uh, as you know, the dynasty continued with Versailles. So the late uh, widow of Henry III on uh, the right, Louise Lorraine, decided to stay uh, in Chenonceau in mourning. And she focused herself on uh, religious and charitable acts. And uh, as she remained there, basically, she was forgotten. Uh, and uh, her finances diminished and Chenonceau lost uh, of its splendor as time passed by. Louise Lorraine was the last uh, uh, queen, uh, a member of the royal family that was the owner of Chenonceau, and after that, the domain passed uh, into cousins uh, and descendants of her branch. However, a hundred years later, on the right, uh, Madame Dupin became uh, one of the owners of Chenonceau, and two of the most important acts that Madame Dupin did uh, were firstly save Chenonceau from the destruction of the revolution. As Chenonceau was out of the royal domain, she managed to prove that she had bought it and was a private citizen. And secondly, she also opened Chenonceau to the arts uh, by having numerous salons and she invited people famous as Voltaire and Rousseau. So Chenonceau had a new beginning as a center of exchange of ideas and philosophies. So as you see, the castle had numerous influences by women and we'll see what these women actually did uh, since Chenonceau didn't uh, end up in its current state initially. So let's see the first part in 1515. As you can see, there's a small tower that's located next to the main building. This is the remnant uh, 
of an old uh, fortified castle that was built on the banks of the river Cher, uh, called the Chateau des Marques from the Marc family. This castle was uh, in, its, in a very simplistic style, quite medieval. Its main purpose was uh, the defense of uh, the river of Cher during the Hundred Year War, since this was a strategic point of view. The Marks castle was destroyed uh, uh, by Thomas Boyer and Catherine Brissonnet, uh, who built uh, the first part uh, of the castle, which is actually the dungeon on the water, based on the uh, actual for ancient fortifications of a windmill. So it was an innovative design uh, to build a castle on uh, the banks, uh, literally the feet in water of the river. Uh, and so afterwards, uh, uh, when this first part uh, was built in 1547, uh, uh, Diane de Poitiers uh, made the acquisition of Chenonceau. Uh, she didn't change anything to the original building. However, as she was focused in gardens, the other side of the river Cher was very interesting for her in terms of development of new garden. And so she wanted to basically have access to these gardens. And so she took uh, the bet uh, with her current ar architect of Chenonceau, Philibert Delorme, to build a bridge directly from the castle uh, spanning out to the other side in order to get to those new buildings. In 1559, uh, Catherine de Medicis takes over the castle and starts building uh, uh, the first Gary from uh, the inspiration of the Florentine Ponte Vecchio. After the, basically the uh, construction of the first Gary, whose main purpose was to have a giant reception area that could host uh, an incredible amount of people and give uh, basically a chenon so a size that would be suiting for having uh, the royal affairs of the court. She decided to build a second gallery on top of it and to finish it completely. We can now see what chenon so looks like in its current state. So on the left, you have the Tour de Marc, which has been remodeled by Thomas Boyer to have a more uh, fitting Renaissance appearance, uh, as initially it was just a basic defense tower. We have uh, the main building, uh, in the typical Renaissance style with the Italian uh, inspirations. Uh, so this style has uh, elements of Gothic flamboyant, uh, which are very popular and right now be have become a kind of a staple of uh, this Renaissance style that you find in Turin, especially in other castles uh, such as uh, Azel Rideau and Blois. Then we have the third part of the castle, which is uh, the extension uh, of the bridge uh, to the other side. An interesting detail is to look at the arches of Chenonceau. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that the arches are not uh, at the same size, and there is uh, some uh, asymmetrical uh, going on here. The reason for this is that uh, as they built Chenonceau, the underlying bedrock was uneven, and so they had to make architectural adaptations in order to fit uh, the bridge properly. So this is why their spacing is completely different. Uh, one last detail that we can look at uh, is uh, on the very far right of the building, uh, there are some stones uh, coming out of the building. So the building, uh, although finished uh, in its current state, uh, was maybe supposed to have another extension uh, on the other side or with maybe another, another tower that would have given it uh, uh, more prestige uh, on the other side of the river. So here we have something that's entirely built uh, by women, uh, strong uh, Renaissance influences, uh, and of course, uh, a perfect alliance of French architecture and Italian modernity. And this uh, uh, is uh, the um, east side of the castle, and we can see the whole estate. So if you look at the central part of the castle, you can see that uh, the square part of the dungeon, uh, which initially is built uh, as a perfect square of 20 meters by 20 meters, uh, is asymmetrical. Uh, there is one side that has two extensions coming out of it. This is done on purpose uh, as the uh, asymmetrical part uh, of it is actually more pleasing to the eye and is not uh, as boring to the visitor. This, uh, the two extensions house uh, the chapel and the library. If you look at the bottom, uh, you would see uh, a massive garden. So this is Diane de Poitiers garden. And right next to it, uh, if you look uh, where I'm pointing, uh, my mouse, uh, this is the chancellerie, which is the house uh, of the person that was in charge of the castle. At the bottom right, uh, we have uh, Catherine's de Medicis's maze. If we go above, uh, we have uh, the farm. We have uh, the old building of the aviary. 
and we have Catherine de Medici's garden, which is much smaller than Diane's garden. So Chenonceau was a castle of pleasure, as I said before. And what's interesting is that you might notice that there are no defenses, there are no fortifications. Uh, there was no need for war, and Chenonceau was completely built as a castle that would be pleasing for its visitor. Not only on the architectural part, uh, but uh, due to its massive garden, uh, it was also uh, seen as a place uh, that wanted to be a perfect alliance between uh, architecture, modernity uh, during its current time, uh, and nature. And so uh, it is some, uh, something that balances perfectly this refinement between uh, uh, what is man-made and what is nature-made. These two alliances uh, make Chenonceau the most visited private French castle in France. Uh, right now, my mother is the curator and has been uh, since nearly 20 years ago. And uh, the company that manages it has about 100 people uh, currently. So if we move on, uh, we will look uh, on at the exceptional collections uh, of Chenonceau, which are also one of the reasons why people uh, come to Chenonceau and visit it. So before I dive a bit deeper into describing some elements of the collections, I'm going to go back to Gabby. And if Gabby may, she can share a video to introduce you to collections. That's great. Thank you, Gabby. Allow me just to go back to the presentation. And here we have uh, one of the many rooms of Chenonceau, actually one of 20, the Salon François Ier. So Chenonceau has the particularity of being an extremely furnished uh, castle for two main reasons. The first one is that uh, uh, Louise de Lorraine stayed there as the last uh, queen of uh, this uh, dynasty. And so as she stayed there, she passed away. And so there were no uh, pillaging as she basically kept most of the royal properties that were there. Unlike many castles that suffered from the fact that uh, kings and queens uh, were moving uh, very frequently between castles and were taking uh, collections with them. The second thing is, of course, the work uh, of Madame Dupin, who saved uh, Chenonceau from uh, the French Revolution, uh, preventing it from being uh, uh, burned down. The main reason for this uh, is that uh, also being a bridge uh, served a utilitarian purpose uh, for the people of the revolution and so it was considered a bad idea to burn it just so she also has a, a very furnished collection uh, some names of painters rubens uh, primatis tintoret correge van lou uh, ribera ribalta Clouet, murillo natier veronese van dyke and zubaran uh, just to name some of them here we can see four portraits of men by Ravenstein, a portrait of a woman by Mirvelsa, two famous uh, Flemish painters of the Flemish Baroque and Dutch Golden Age, very known for uh, their portraits of people. In the center uh, on the left, uh, we have a portrait of Diane de Poitiers as Diane, uh, Diane Chasseresse by Le Primatis. I will not go too much into details about Le Primatis, 
since uh, uh, I believe my next my, the next speaker of the presentation will be Oriane from Fontainebleau, and she will cover it as the Primatisse is one of the famous painters, uh, French painters of the first school of Fontainebleau. On the right, uh, you have a portrait, portrait of uh, Laure Marie Victoire Mancini, the niece of Mazarin, by Daniel Dumoutier, a rather less known painter, but was extremely renowned for his uh, crayon drawings. If we move along, yeah. in a different room, uh, we have two portraits. The first one being the Street Graces uh, by Van Loo, a French painter that's noted for the simplicity of its traits. Uh, here, he represented uh, the three favorites uh, of Louis XV uh, in some kind of, un of a natural way, nearly mystique. On the right, uh, you have a portrait uh, of Louis XIV by Yassine Rigaud. Uh, Yassine Rigaud was the portraitist uh, of the king and so made many versions of Louis XIV's uh, portraits. This one is very well known because of its frame, as you might have noticed. Uh, the frame is from uh, Le Potre and is composed uh, of uh, four massive uh, uh, wooden uh, piles stick together, and it's in Rococo style. A masterpiece uh, is uh, this drawing uh, of uh, Christ Child and Saint John the Baptist uh, by uh, Rubens. Here we see all of Rubens' geniuses in its technique, uh, not academic but more intuitive, uh, its mastery of lights, the way the bodies are shaped. Uh, and uh, gives a very intimate depiction uh, of a religious scene. Sochon also is not also well known uh, for its uh, uh, collections, but also for its inside architecture. On the left, uh, you can see a crossed uh, rib vault ceiling. Uh, so you can see that it's not a straight, uh, and this is a particularity of this rib vault, which is uh, quite unique. Uh, but very representative of the kind of innovation you would find in architecture during the first Renaissance. On the right, uh, you have a view of the chapel. Uh, the chapel was saved uh, by Madame Dupin during the Renaissance as she turned it into a wood pile in order to hide uh, uh, every uh, religious uh, uh, signs, otherwise it was gonna be burned down. Uh, the stained glass, unfortunately, is not of origin as it uh, broke down and melted uh, due to Allied bombings in 1944. So they were remade uh, more recently by Max Angrel. So as I mentioned previously, Louise de Lorraine, on uh, the left, we have a portrait of Henry III, her husband, by Francois Clouet, one of the uh, most famous portraitists of kings uh, during this era. As Francois III, uh, died, uh, he sent a letter to his ruin, uh, bidding her to stay in Chenonceau and wait for his return. Unfortunately, uh, Henry III uh, uh, passed away, uh, but with uh, uh took wor words of this letter very precisely and uh, shut herself in uh, mourning and took on a very religious life. Uh, so we see a detail from her room, uh, which has a very mournful appearance. The walls of the room are dark, and filled with a religious symbol. And you have a Christ with thorns in wood uh, that's pictured here. She also has, of course, kitchens. So here we have a view of the larder on the left and the view of the main kitchens on the right. The kitchens are located in the piles of the building, uh, of the main building. Interestingly, uh, you could access the kitchens from the river, of course. Uh, the deliveries of producers were mainly by boats. And so uh, you have uh, four different rooms. Uh, most of the equipment in the kitchens is more modern uh, since kitchens were considered a piece of technology. Uh, uh, they were usually upgraded quite often to the newest standards. Uh, on the left, you see a floral uh, creation. Uh, also has a floral workshop uh, uh, with three people working full-time in order to decorate all the rooms uh, with uh, fresh flowers and new creations. Of course, the highlight of Chenonceau is uh, uh, the Great Gary. So the Great Gary spans uh, 60 meters uh, across the share and has 18 windows. Uh, the Gary uh, initially conceived uh, uh, as a bridge by Diane de Poitiers and then covered by Catherine de Médicis uh, uh, served its role as a salle des fêtes, uh, where festivities and lavish parties uh, were uh, given to the numerous guests and uh, future kings that visited. 
if we move along here, we go out of Chenonceau and we will look at the gardens. So firstly, uh, this is uh, Catherine de Medicis garden, much smaller and uh, uh, conceived after Diane de Poitiers garden. Catherine de Medicis idea of a garden uh, was to have something smaller, more refined and more intimistic. So the numerous box hedges, uh, the water piece in the middle and the rose trees uh, uh, offer a very good example of what can be a French garden uh, using geometrical lines uh, and still retain uh, some simplicity and some refinement. The second garden built initially by Diane de Poitiers is Diane's garden. Diane de Poitiers first built this garden uh, when she saw that the field next to Chenonceau was unoccupied, but unfortunately it was, uh, uh, there were many floods uh, from uh, the river. So she built uh, a 12 meter uh, reinforced wall around uh, to elevate the garden and protect it from the floods. Uh, the garden is uh, a, about double the size uh, of Catherine de Medicis's garden. Uh, it is about uh, uh, 12,000 square meters uh, and hasn't changed much from its uh, original design. Although two alleys were added in the 19th century uh, by a garden composer called Achille Duchesne and has a massif of uh, elms, uh, sorry, uh, boxed, uh, uh, box hedges, uh, rose trees, and hibiscus uh, trees. Uh, in total, between the two gardens, uh, they, have, they are flowered uh, uh, twice per year, and the number of plants uh, are over 130,000 per year. Uh, we now have the maze of Catherine Medicis. Uh, the original maze, unfortunately, was destroyed, uh, but uh, at the time, Catherine de Medicis had built a maze uh, for entertainment uh, uh, and also as it was a manner to show that nature could be handled. Uh, so this maze uh, has been uh, readapted uh, in the early 2000s uh, uh, by my parents, uh, who composed it uh, of uh, 2000 ewes. Uh, the maze serves more of an entertaining purpose, and the pagoda in the middle allows us uh, to see uh, the whole maze uh, and serves just as a recreational activity. So Chenonceau becomes a family home uh, in 1913. My ancestor Henri Meignier was uh, the owner of a chocolate factory called Chocolat Meignier and made the acquisition of Chenonceau who is uh, in the public sale. Unfortunately, uh, of course, in 1914, uh, uh, the events of the First World War unfolded, and so Chenonceau was converted to a military hospital. And so my family uh, managed this hospital. My great-grandmother was the chief nurse of this hospital, and uh, more than 2,254 uh, soldiers uh, were uh, cured and uh, taken care of in Chenonceau. Uh, and so we see a picture of the beds in the Great Gary. Uh, there were also beds uh, above in the second Gary on top of the chair. Unfortunately, after the First World War, uh, Chenonceau is closed uh, for uh, the public, and the Second World War happens uh, in 1939. Chenonceau plays, uh, again, a very interesting role during this era. As, uh, as you can see on... Uh, the right side of the bank, so the side where you have the small mark terror, this was the occupied zone, so occupied by the Nazi Germans. But on the right bank, on the other side, it was considered the free zone, which was under management from the Vichy government. So Chenonceau, being, of course, a bridge, played a tactical role. So uh, when the Germans uh, uh, invaded France, uh, they took position around the castle and uh, nearly destroyed it. Uh, and it's thanks to the negotiation of my uh, great-grandmother that uh, Chenonceau stayed the way it was, uh, by, but it had to stay closed down. Uh, fortunately, uh, the art wasn't uh, stolen and uh, sent to Germany. Uh, however, uh, there was an a artillery piece that was meant to uh, gun down planes that was uh, uh, aiming at the castle 24-7, and also they were... Uh, bombs that were ready to explode in the pillars uh, uh, in case there was an attack. So after 
World War II should also opens itself up to the public. And uh, with the advent of mass tourism, it also becomes, uh, uh, as I said previously, the most visited castle in France. But it also is not a place that is stuck in time. Uh, its uh, conservancy efforts and its curation uh, have created, uh, uh, of course, new exhibits and new designs. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about two recent events that happened uh, in Chenonceau. Uh, the first one being the creation of a new garden. So interestingly, uh, about eight years ago, my mother found in uh, one of uh, the family drawers uh, some original, original uh, drawings uh, by the famous uh, British gardener, Russell Page. And so working with our chief botanist, Nicolas Tomlan, who is head botanist of uh, Longwood Garden in Philadelphia, uh, we managed to create a garden that is inspired from the work of Russell Page. So here we always have uh, uh, different plants, uh, uh, different elevation, as you can see in the garden, uh, and a central water piece. And so this garden uh, marks the latest addition in terms of gardens uh, to Ch in Chenon. So using uh, original uh, designs and also original plants of Russell Page. Uh, maybe some of you have recognized uh, uh, some sculptures from François Xavier Lalanne. Uh, they come from uh, an art exhibition, a retrospective uh, in the 90s, uh, and fit as well the theme uh, of Russell Page, which was to include uh, uh, modern art in the middle of uh, his garden. Here you can see uh, one of his famous sheep, a frog, and there are also four other sheep and a fish. Uh, the second new addition to the exhibit is the uh, apothecary of Catherine de Medicis. Catherine de Medicis had a uh, uh, great passion for anything related to astrology, herbs, uh, and medicine. So she had an apothecary in which she spent a lot of time uh, in Chenonceau uh, with one of her doctors and advisors, which you might know as Nostradamus. And unfortunately, as time passed by, this apothecary was uh, uh, just uh, run completely run down. So uh, my mother, in a creation effort, uh, uh, over maybe six to eight years, uh, managed to gather this uh, apothecary ensemble, which comes from a Florentine palace. Uh, so the woodwork uh, comes from Italy. And what's interesting is that it, is that it fitted the room uh, exactly to the nearest centimeter and has added uh, more than 500 medicinal pots uh, uh, from this era in which uh, uh, different uh, herbal concoctions uh, were prepared. So here we have uh, a better view and different uh, details of uh, the medicinal pots uh, and anything that's related to uh, scales and measures. Uh, so uh, this kind of apothecary is extremely rare to find in France as most of them uh, were just uh, destroyed uh, or being too run down uh, since uh, this uh, kind of a uh, practice uh, uh, fell out of interest uh, uh, centuries ago. Now, let's talk about the ongoing projects in Chenonceau. So there are upcoming projects uh, that have not yet been revealed. And of course, uh, with the current situation, we don't know when they will come uh, uh, to light. So the first one is uh, uh, the Curiosity Cabinet of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, was a frequent visitor of uh, Chenonceau under Madame Dupin in order to uh, uh, basically attend a salon and exchanges of ideas with other philosophers. And he even uh, uh, took on the education of one of her sons, uh, which ended up being a very uh, big failure because the son was actually terrible. But uh, there are a lot of items related to him in Chenonceau in, that uh, he used in order to uh, try and ed educate uh, Madame Dupin's son. So in the curiosity cabinet, uh, we have a lot of items that were of educative manner towards the science and physics and mathematics. And we'll present this uh, exhibition uh, soon. And the second uh, uh, exhibit that we will open uh, will be the tapestry room. Uh, here you have a very uh, beautiful example of a tapestry who's called Tapis Tapisserie dit de l'Aristoloche. Aristoloche are a type of flower that were very common in tapestries of the Renaissance era. So this floral ensemble 
uh, becomes a staple of this design, which starts from the 16th century up to the 18th or 19th century. So the idea is to create a room that would house some of the tapestries that are already in Chenonceau, but dispersed around the castle. Adding to this, uh, another tapestry of uh, Chenonceau, this one more recent of the 19th century, which presents a more romantic side of Chenonceau. Uh, you will notice an interesting detail is the Venetian gondola on the bottom right, which is due to one of the previous owners, Madame Pelouse, who actually bought from it back from Venice a gondola and its gondola in order to have uh, uh, Italian theme, theme parties in the 19th century. After talking about uh, uh, these uh, future projects, uh, uh, I will be ending this presentation uh, with a view of the Great Elm Alley at night, uh, a view that you can, act, you can actually admire uh, during summer, uh, during the Promenade Nocturne. And hopefully uh, it will be something that uh, all of you can enjoy in the future when better times uh, are upon us. And so I will unshare my screen and back to you, Russell. Thank you very much, Henri, for your excellent overview. Very well organized exterior, interior, gardens, and projects. We, we learned a lot. We, there are a number of questions that were posed on the chat line. Uh, when looking at the, um, for, first of all, the art collection that you highlighted at the beginning, was it already there when uh, your family acquired the chateau? Did you have to purchase the pieces to recreate the art collection? Uh, and are the pieces, did you find the pieces that were originally in the chateau or are they representative from the past? Yeah, actually uh, a lot of the pieces are directly from Chenonceau and were there when my family made the acquisition. Uh, of course, over the years uh, with the creation efforts, there have been a number of acquisitions. Uh, uh, first acquisitions to find pieces that were previously in Chenonceau but were uh, sold, lost, or just moved from other castles. Uh, and of course, acquisitions uh, uh, that are focused, uh, for example, the portrait of Henry III uh, is something that was probably not in Chenonceau, but it's, it's so related to Henry III, it is a, a very, very precious painting. And so it is a, absolutely something that we uh, looked uh, towards uh, adding it to the collection because it's something that the visitor will find uh, interesting and will improve the visiting experience. So, so it's a constant work that uh, my mother and I are doing uh, in order to uh, embellish the castle. Mm -hmm. Perfect word, embellish. Uh, is it also the case for the furniture? You said that it's very well furnished. Mm -hmm. Was the, yes. the furniture that there, has it always been there or been there since? Uh... Yep, actually most of it has, uh, has always been there. So I, talk, I talked about paintings, but yeah, anything that's related to beds, uh, anything that's related to uh, tables, secretaries, uh, a lot of tapestries have already, in, uh, already been here. Okay. Uh, another, uh, who, you mentioned that uh, Philibert de Lomme, uh was the architect for the bridge built by Diane de Poitiers. Who was the architect uh, who built the galleries uh, for uh, Catherine de Medici? Yep, so uh, Catherine de Medici, of course, didn't take Philibert de Lorme because it was the architect of Diane de Poitiers. Uh, so he was basically kicked out. Uh, and so there isn't one architect, but numerous architects with different architects uh, during the construction because some of them, unfortunately, couldn't complete it due to various reasons. Some of them passed away. Some of them just couldn't do it. Uh, so we can't attribute the construction of the this, uh, the gallery and the gallery above us for just one architect. So that's why we say that one of the main architects of Chenonceau is Philibert de Lorme, because there's just too many people after that. Okay. And uh, are there, do there exist plans uh, that show just how ambitious the project of Catherine de Medici was? Was it Catherine de Medici or Diane de Poitiers who wanted to extend the chateau on the far bank, the south bank? Yeah, share. there are some, uh, some plans by Andrew du Cerceau, which are, you can check uh, online. Uh, of course, they were just plans. Uh, maybe you could say that they were delusions of grandeur by Catherine de Medici, but no, 
nevertheless very interesting to look at, uh, although uh, we can safely say that the plans would have rendered uh, uh, the current building of Chenonceau very minor and the whole greater things and would have probably lost uh, its uh, distinctiveness uh, and uh, refinement. Uh. Okay. Uh, so still on the question of Catherine de Medici, uh, she, did she, uh, she also built uh, the Chateau de Luxembourg. Uh, no, pardon, the Tuileries. She built the Tuileries Palace, n'est-ce pas? Uh, Catherine de Medici. Um, so she was trading her time between these two principal chateaux. Yeah, indeed, she was also in uh, Blois, and uh, she wanted uh, her center of power to be more in the Loire Valley. Uh, so the reason why the initially the center of power was in the Loire Valley is because of all the skirmishes uh, uh, next to Bordeaux during the Hundred Year War. And so once the skirmishes ended uh, and uh, things settled down uh, after Catherine de Medicis, uh, uh, the royal court took a more permanent presence in Paris. And that's uh, how, unfortunately, most of the Loire Valley Castle uh, ended their relationship with uh, the royal families. And the Cat Catherine, did she, Catherine de Medici, did she die at Chenonceau? Uh, no, she died in Blois. At Blois. Mm. Right. Thank you. Has anyone lived in the chateau uh, since, when was the last time it was inhabited? Uh, I believe it was uh, during uh, the era between uh, World War I and World War II. Uh, after the hospital, there was maybe some uh, people that, that inhabited it, but very, uh, in a very small amount of time uh, uh, because the interior is not made to be inhabited in, like, with the current standards. Uh, and it has never been uh, upgraded since, uh, since basically it's uh, uh, all the castle is meant to be visited uh, and none of it is uh, private. That means we don't live in it or there are not, there isn't a part of the castle that's reserved for, for the family. Okay, like there is in many other uh, chateaux. Um, did you have to, uh, is, so the chateau that you inherited, uh, that you acquired, uh, did it require much in the way of restoration uh, for the chateau proper? You mentioned replacing the uh, stained glass windows that were damaged. Were there uh, was there much other major master restoration work required for the chateau uh, exterior? Uh, actually, the exterior uh, until recent times not really. Uh, a lot of work has been done, of course, on the gardens uh, that were were not really taken care of in the same way that they are now because it wasn't a fully running company until the 60s. Uh, however, the latest uh, massive work that Schnulze undertook was the restoration of its uh, rooftops. Uh, so something you usually have to do at least every 100 to 150 years. Uh, and this was an ongoing project uh, that cost uh, several millions. Uh, uh, and went on for, I think, more than four years. Uh, and so during this uh, time, uh, the works were not only restorative, but there were also some interesting discoveries uh, in uh, the attics of Chenonceau with different inscriptions uh, that were found. Uh, so it, it was something necessary, but it also uncovered a lot of like interesting work on the curation side. Did you discover archives? Are there archives that showed the various building works over the centuries? Uh, no, we didn't discover archives, but there are some messages and drawings in the, in basically uh, the attics that we, find, we found on wood pieces that were not really accessible before. So that, that was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, you mentioned that your, uh, the other Henri Meunier, uh, your great, great, great uncle uh, who bought the Chateau in 1930, 1913 uh, was the same Meunier of Min, Min Meunier Chocolatier. And the question has been asked is, is that the business, is that company still around? So the company is still around. Uh, it belongs to Nestle. Uh, so the Chocolat Meunier after World War II basically didn't recover uh, because of the destruction uh, of uh, the war in France uh, and also the increased competition from uh, American firms. Uh, so the family had to sell it. So it was bought by a firm called Rory McIntosh, uh, which was then acquired by Nestle. So Nestle has the Chocolat Meunier in its portfolio of brands. 
Uh, they still issue Chocolat Menier and you can find it in store. However, it's considered as a historical brand. So they don't really push it uh, or do any active marketing with it. Uh, and they just edit one uh, uh, item, which is the basic uh, chocolate uh, tablet. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned that uh, your mother has been the curator for the past 20 years. Uh, and, and did she grow up at uh, Chenonso? Uh, what is her background that uh, qual that uh, qualified her as a curator? Oh my, well, my mother started curating at, uh, way before that, as soon as she met uh, my father, pretty much as they took care of Chenonso during that time. And so, uh, although she didn't have a, a formal, uh, I would say, education as an art curator. She's always been extremely versed uh, in uh, the uh, arts uh, and anything related to uh, uh, yeah, the historical uh, periods. Uh, so it was something that uh, naturally came to her. And so uh, in uh, the two year 2000s, the previous uh, person that was run running it passed away and she took over the job formally. But uh, uh, she, her, uh, I would say her role has been active for more than, uh, I would say, uh, 35 years at least. Okay. And, uh, probably. 45, yeah. Ever before your day, before your time. Yep, yep. <laughs> so we've seen pictures from uh, Paris of uh, floods of the Seine. Uh, it's like uh, high levels at the Seine. Is the Cher uh, also reaching high levels? Do you have Grand Cru? Uh, you mentioned earlier that sometimes the garden of Diane de Poitiers flooded. Yep. Yeah. So we currently don't have one, but the biggest one we had uh, uh, recently was one in uh, May 2016, uh, where, yeah, actually Dian most of Diana's garden uh, went underwater because the water uh, coming back up from underground. Unfortunately, uh, except, you know, the fact that it was very pretty, uh, there wasn't any damage to the castle. However, there was maybe 10 centimeters. Uh, uh, between the level of the water and the windows of the kitchen uh, in the main pillar. So this, the sandbags were ready wow. uh, to come into action and we probably avoided a disaster uh, by a matter of a couple days. Uh, some of the castles uh, like Chambord, for example, were less fortunate where a, a lot of the insides went uh, underwater. Uh, and I think the, la the latest huge flood that happened in France was in the, in the 40s, but it was a long time before, so. Yeah. Um, all, we have a few epicures in the audience too, who uh, are curious about your restaurants. And you had a, 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 we were there last summer and the restaurant in the Orangerie, is that what it is? Yep, that's correct. It's uh, in the building of the uh, Orangerie, which was where uh, trees were stored and also an old uh, aviary for Catherine de Medici. Uh -huh. So that, you have two places, that's your haute cuisine there and then a separate Cafeteria, is it in the stables? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Of course, yeah, the, the restaurants have been uh, closed down since uh, COVID uh, and uh, the situation is uh, probably make, uh, making us to look at differently at uh, what kind of offering we'll propose to uh, uh, our visitors when we open. So we've had several questions as I've been po postponing it to ask, but uh, it has not uh, failed to reach the attention of our audience that you hosted uh, a défilé de mode uh, a fashion show for Chanel in December. Would you please explain how that came about and, and what was involved? Yeah, of course. So we had relationships with the Maison Chanel since the early 2000s. And uh, earlier last year, uh, Chanel contacted us as they had scouted the place uh, and thought it would be uh, an interesting uh, uh, place to do the defile. So they came with uh, some demands. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the historical link of Chanel and Chanel so, uh, uh, is evident as the double crossed sea of uh, Coco Chanel uh, is inspired from the double crossed sea of Catherine de Medici. Uh, so this was, uh, of course, natural. And uh, uh, so we managed to uh, arrange uh, for the fashion show to happen uh, uh, in December. And uh, unfortunately, COVID uh, uh, hit. Uh, and so we had France enter the second lockdown uh, in October. And so uh, the Chanel team was very efficient and managed to set up uh, uh, the defile, which happened, I believe, the 2nd of December. 
and it was a, a beautiful collection that they uh, they presented uh, uh, with no audience, of course, because of the COVID rules. Uh, and uh, I'll invite uh, everyone that's uh, participating here to go and check it out online on YouTube or in, on, on Chanel's website, which is the Défilé Chanel Métier d'Art. We will send it to everyone so that they can enjoy it uh, after this lecture. Um, and uh, we have to uh, also point out, and this is a personal question, it's got nothing to do with the chateau, it's got to do with you. Uh, your English is perfect, bravo. Yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, so how did you manage to pull that off? <laughs> I, I cheated, I had a British nanny when I was uh, very small, so I picked up English very quickly. Uh, and then after I've always continued practicing English uh, uh, during my undergrad studies, uh, visiting uh, the United States very frequently. Uh, my wife is uh, American, so we speak English together. And my most recent MBA studies were in English. Bravo. But someone uh, still, <laughs> it's not your, your first language, so that's oh. uh, bravo. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, I think we will uh, wrap it up here. And I would like to extend my uh, our sincere thanks to you, Henri, uh, for making yourself available uh, for this really fascinating presentation. We've learned so much about Chanonceau, and you certainly in inspired us to come and see it in person uh, during the day, and also for one of these nocturne, promenade nocturne, which are. I do have a final question in the from the audience. What what is the, explain what happens in the. Uh, Promenade Nocturne, s'il vous plaît. Yeah, sure. So it uh, starts uh, in the evening, I think around nine in the summer. And so you are you basically uh, walk around the gardens lit up uh, and you admire Chanonceau that is completely lit up uh, with uh, uh, some musical arrangements. Uh, so it's uh, a night a night walk pretty much in uh, uh, with a beautiful scenery. Mm. Well, we certainly hope we can enjoy that uh, this summer. Uh, and I would like to re repeat uh, that uh, in the next day or two, everyone who's been listening to this lecture will receive a recording of the lecture. In addition, we'll include a link uh, to the 11 minute video on YouTube about the incredibly popular Chanel uh, uh, show, which had 2 million visits viewers, which uh, exceeds the, the number of people we've had in our lecture series by a little. Uh, and I'd like to thank, in addition to Henri, the, our co-host for this series, the Alliance Francaise uh, Miami Metro, the Alliance Francaise de Chicago, and our partners, the French Heritage Society, the Federation of Alliance Francaise, and Weiss in Paris. And I'd like to thank everyone in the audience today for joining us. And to mention that next week we will leave the Loire Valley uh, and for the region around Paris known as the Ile de France, where we will join our hero, Francois Premier, when, once again at his favorite chateau of the many chateaux that he built or rebuilt during his 32 year reign, when we will uh, have a tour of the historic Chateau de Fontainebleau with its her heritage curator, Oriane Beaufils, uh, and her lecture will be in English as well as will all five remaining lectures in the series. So I would ask everyone in the audience to please unmute themselves and to join me in giving a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.